we got three more arriving. Excellent. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Richard Self, as you can see, and as it said on the programme, and I'm the uh, le senior lecturer in the Governance Advanced and Emerging Technologies at the University of Derby. And I've been looking at governance now for about 15 years. I spent 30 odd years uh, of my early career in aerospace, and I did work across almost all the areas in the company. And so I've got a lot of business or so industrial experience. Uh, I was a systems analyst at the very beginning, uh, designing and developing and leading the testing of software, the sort of thing that's pretty close to your heart, I guess. And then in about 2000, I ran out of interest in jobs to do in industry and decided I'd leave. I took a, a redundancy package and then tried to start up a small business with my brother. Uh, that went bust within about 18 months, so I then looked around and ended up at university. And that's that I've never been so happy because watching those light bulb moments when my students sort of really catch on to what's going on has been very, very interesting and very, very fun. And I'm very lucky as an academic because I don't have to go to too many academic conferences, I don't have to write too many academic papers, if any at all, because my role is to get out here. If I write an academic paper, it'll be read or it'll be listened to by perhaps maybe no more than a dozen people, all of whom are presented in that stream, plus a, uh, a chair or two. And no one ever reads the papers. But here, I get to talk to quite a lot of people. And my role is actually to get out and about, talk to people, the business people, find out what's going on, and you know, tell them some of the stuff that's coming out of the research that I and my students are doing in the field of the emerging um, and rather interesting advanced technologies. I'm on LinkedIn as Richard J. Self, LLM, but I do have a Master of Laws in Conflict Studies and Dispute Resolution, which is a, a change from the, the work I was doing in aerospace that then allowed me to Get, get hold of this uh, uh, lectureship. But today's talk is actually going to be quite interesting, I think, for many of you. I gave a predecessor to this talk about two years ago at the National Software Testing North up in, uh, where was it, Leeds, a couple of years ago, in the spring, <clears throat> just before we sort of all things fell apart. Because you guys, I hope, are experts in the sort of testing, that's what software test engineering is all about, is testing the software that someone else has built as a part of a uh, business system, traditionally. And we know how to do the testing to varying degrees of uh, effectiveness. But if we have a traditional system which is kind of algorithmic, and where you have a complete specification provided to you, you can sort of take the code as it comes, you can actually also build from the spec, in a sense, all the way of testing all, essentially all the pathways through the software to make sure it actually works. And you can have a fairly high degree of confidence um, that the software is meeting the spec. Okay, I know there's a little bit of a problem that sometimes the systems analysts and the business analysts don't get the spec exactly right, and you get a nasty surprise uh, towards the end of the, the, the development program when the customer said, no, not doing what I wanted to do. <clears throat> but that's a different problem. However, when we start looking at these AI and advanced analytics systems that we're using today, which essentially are learning from the data that you present to them, all bets are off. Your standard, traditional test harnesses approach won't work. So I want to talk a little bit about what are the differences, why they're there, and then see if we can find some things that actually make it work, or at least 
get more successful. Now, before I move on to that, I want to go back over history. In the last 25 years, an organisation called the Standish Group has been collecting data about the success of traditional algorithmic, normal sort of business systems. In terms of are they successful, defined upon time to budget, and initially delivering the functionality that was designed, agreed upon, now since 2013, delivering business value. And then failures, well, that's the bottom line, the red and orange, which is bumbling along about 20% failure right now. And then all the rest there, the late over budget, uh, don't deliver the functionality, or not all of it, and doesn't deliver business value. There's some rather interesting things which I don't have time to go into here about why <coughs> the, the definition of success has changed from functionality to business value. What I will point out, I'm going to go here, you see, this is where they changed it <coughs> and they back um, tested it to the previous two events, 2011 and 12. <clears throat> because of the CIOs who challenged Spanish Group said, look, we're not delivering, wanting to deliver just functionality, we're wanting to deliver business value, and we're delivering business value, aren't we? <clears throat> and then they got the shock of their lives when they saw they had, this is delivering functionality, this was delivering success, uh, a value. And since then, we've been bumbling along, and about 30% of projects are on time to budget delivering value. Now, it's fairly unpleasant to think that we're only delivering <coughs> about 30%. And this is a, a, a worldwide survey, uh, and they have a database of over 50,000 uh, implementations which are sort of being updated year by year. So we have a serious problem in the industry. Even with all of your expertise in testing using all of our traditional approaches test harnesses and stuff. What compounds things even more, and this messes up not your co the code that you're testing and signing off, but messes up management analytics, management statistics and so on, is the veracity problem that something like 80% of all of the data we have around us is of uncertain veracity. Not that that data are always wrong, but we just can't be certain without careful investigation. And some of you probably have been involved in big implementations of brand new systems, maybe like an ERP system to replace everything else, and then you put the SAP or something like that in place. And you discover you've got to delete through the data cleansing process before you drill out, it's something of the order of 70% of all the master data. Because it's got out of date, it got dirty, people have been messing with it. I don't know if you've noticed, but I saw, looking back on the company I was working for, that through my students who went in there as uh, interns and so on, that within five years of implementing SAP, they were having to do major and continuous data cleansing of the master data, it had got contaminated. And this has some very interesting and very, very important um, impacts on testing of learning systems, all of these AI types of things that we're talking about. It makes life very much more difficult for us. You know all of this lot. This is what you do every day, or most of you do. And today, you know, we've got or building massive harnesses of test scripts and someone was just talking to beforehand and pointing out in a meeting yesterday, it can even, that they've now got tools that can even take the spec and kind of verify the whole darn thing. I'm building it all for you. But in the world of AI, it gets a bit difficult. Now, I want to, this, Definition here that's on the board or on the screen is very, very important because it's the European Union's uh, AI Act, which is draft at the moment out for discussion. It's been discussed in expert uh, groups for a couple of years now. 
and so on. But what's important is we've had a lot of issues about what is AI. What's the artificial bit mean? What does the intelligence bit mean? And does it mean just mean that all of this neural networking sort of stuff that's being used often for image recognition and uh, classification and so on? And when I first heard about this and first saw, before I got to this definition, I thought, oh, it's going to be talking mainly about the modern generation three type of AI systems, the learning systems. It turns out, actually, it's much broader than that. Yes, it's all these neural networky sorts of things uh, for machine learning, all the different ways it's done. But it also picks up ex the expert systems, knowledge-based systems, symbolic logic type systems from generations two, one and two, from the 60s and the 70s, 80s. But the real sting in the tail, folks, is that last one because that picks up on almost all of the advanced big data analytics technology that's been used since 2000. Predictive analytics, Bayesian estimations, and so on. Search and optimization. It says everything that we've been doing in the world of data science since around about 2000 is in principle subject to the EU AIA. And that's an interesting message. I don't have a problem with it. I think it's actually, from an ethics point of view, um, a very, very wise move of the EU to do this. Now, I'm not going to go into how they define all of the, the banned technology uses and the high risk to which the Act actually applies. I'll just say that the Act applies and categorizes almost all the systems involved in control systems affecting national infrastructure, um, other safety aspects, uh, and also pretty much any business type system that's doing any of these types of analysis. So it could well have very, very far reaching effects. The legal aspects are that it can be self-certified, probably. So that's kind of a little bit of a problem around the edges. But let's not worry about that. But just take note of the breadth of its application. Now, the thing about all of these AI systems and yeah, machine learning is they are learning systems. They are designed to learn the patterns in the data presented to them. The specification that you will be working with produces the software that does the learning. There is no specification that says what the system will learn from the data presented to it. So you have to train it. So you put it into the learning mode and present huge amounts of data to it. And it chunders through it and finds using statistical techniques, basically, what does it fit together, how does it fit together, is it clustered, all these sort of bits. And then when you are reasonably happy that it's doing what you think it ought to be doing, or at least that it's learned everything that's in the data, you then switch it out of learning mode, mostly, and put it into active mode, where you present, it's in a sense, of transactions worth of data, to it, and it does something and spits out a kind of an answer of some sort. Often, a yes or a no. Is it itself credit worthy enough for a mortgage of yay large, with payments of so much? Yes, no. Computer says yes, computer says no. And so these systems, you can bolt together the same package of software and then give it two sets of data, and it will do two sets of different things if the data are di significantly different. So the behavior is fundamentally based only on the training, the data that's presented to it. What's even more interesting, and we'll see one in a minute, where the actual training process 
can have significant impact, as up to all of the biases in the data that come pours through the stuff. But the overall behavior is, is indeterminate, is probabilistic, and it, as I say, it depends entirely on the training and the data that we have available to us. Now, one of the things that's getting everybody very, or at least ethicists, very, very worried is how badly and how uh, strongly these systems uh, pick up the biases and then reinforce the biases that are there, whether it's ethnicity, socio-demography uh, type of parameters, gender, etc., etc. There's one reported by, against Apple when they brought out their new uh, credit card a few, a few months ago, and it was giving males much, much higher credit limits than females. Or in terms of recidivist uh, ratings, for example, that a, a system out there that you go to court, you're taken to court, accused of something, and then your case is deferred. So do you get bail or not get bail? And for a variety of reasons, the system in Chicago and in north, somewhere up in the north of England, all the questions that actually from a one perspective, look quite sensible. Many of them seem to co um, co correlate with are you black or are you not black? And there's nothing you can do if you keep that same set of data collection, there's nothing you can do to change that algorithm to not be ethnically biased. And the Amazon HR project, which ran for about five years, they were trying to find a, an AI way of filtering all of those hundreds or thousands of job applications that they get all the time. And they wanted to have a filter, an AI-based filter that would learn from the past all of 10,000 applications that they've had over the previous X years. And then they got Fortunately, and I mean, it is to their credit that they realised eventually by 2016, I think, or 17, that it was massively gender biased. It only put males through to the short, uh, shortlist process. It was picking, as it happened, it was picking up on things like the name of the colleges, universities that the applicants had gone to, and if you went to one which is known to be a female college, university, not recommended, and so on. Turns out, actually, when you look at the real, really what's going on, and with a bit of knowledge of how uh, people write CVs on average, they're onto hiding to nothing anyway. They can't solve that problem, but initially, the report says Amazon tried to change the algorithm, but of course as a learning system you cannot change the algorithm, it will not learn. You can't change the algorithm to say ignore gender, other than by switching out, deleting the gender uh, tick box. IBM Watson was an even more interesting one when they tried to develop from Jeopardy system to uh, an oncology advisory system, they trained it up, they read hundreds of thousands of academic papers and medical papers and so on, learned a lot. And have been trained at one of the great, the, the ex most expert hospital in the world, Johns Hopkins, I think also in Kettering, I forget which. Anyway, they got it to a level where they were fairly comfortable with doing the right sort of thing. And they were going to license it out to lots of hospitals who didn't have that level of expertise. The only problem was when they got, got it out there to other hospitals, developing countries, Western countries, you know, even hospitals in the USA, it didn't work because of the training bias. Because it was the training that it got was based on the technologies and the protocols and expertise in that hospital that trained it. And most of those things weren't applicable or weren't available in these other hospitals, it didn't work. Because it couldn't take account of those factors, because it wasn't trained to take account of them. 
And what we're seeing is, and we don't know the numbers properly, but we know that the number of successful AI projects from proof of concept to implementation is certainly well below the 30% that Standish Group figures are tracking us at. It could, anecdotally, it could be 20% successful projects or less. And this is a really big worry because the amount of money that's being poured into all of these AI and analytics systems is enormous. What's beginning to become very clear is where, broadly, the levels of failure are highest and where we have successes. It appears that any topic or any subject area that's related to what we traditionally call social sciences, that includes business and management, psychology, psychometrics, some aspects of financial services, these are where the failures are happening. And part of the reason is that the, the data that's being used to, do, to train the systems are not the direct data, unlike in science and engineering, which I'll talk about in a second. All of the data are proxy, or well, they may be not just proxies of, uh, of the thing you're trying to do. You know, think about um, personality testing, um, Myers, Myers Briggs test. Probably some of you have done the Myers-Briggs test. And you looked at the question and thought, they have nothing to do with whether I'm a J or an M or an L or a K or a whatever the numbers letters are. Those, are. those questions are probably first, second, maybe even third order proxies for what they're trying to identify. They're subjective. Probably affected by how how kind of feeling, whether you're feeling up or down, or whether you're feeling up real hungover from a bad night out. There are no causal theories. There are 20 different theories out there in psychometrics. There's you know, in pedagogy, the science of the so-called science of learning and teaching. There are dozens of them. Anybody can invent one and go no, 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 like that and do a little bit of correlation perhaps. And, uh, they think it's kind of, well, these are factors that might be interesting, but there aren't any proper causality related models that can be proven. Otherwise, there wouldn't be 50 different variants. And of course, there's no intelligence anywhere at all in these systems. They are just statistical uh, propinquity type measuring systems, most of them. Not the uh, uh, knowledge based systems, they're a bit different but they were too difficult to build the symbolic logic systems of the 1980s, all too difficult to build under most circumstances, all very tricky. Where we see the successes, however, are where we can put a voltmeter on the thing or measure something directly that we know from the engineering and the science and the physics and the chemistry that there is a causal model, causal theory between you know, that jet engine or that big wind turbine, the whole thing is designed with engineering and science and physics. And we know how it all works. We've got formulae coming out of our ears, which we've tested over the last 50, 100, 200 years. We've even got some beginnings of success with protein folding. But again, that's chemistry and that's math. Maybe a little bit of quantum fuzziness sitting around somewhere that makes it a little bit more complicated. But at least these are the areas where we are certainly seeing a lot of success, whether it's the uh, neural networking, uh, machine learning, or down the predictive analytics sort of level. These are successful because the data is uncontaminated by human finger or human uh, subjectivity. You know, our sensors have a little bit of a problem occasionally, but by and large, it's not a problem. And even the top one, the curling up there, you know, that's friction. I, uh, what's it? Granite, polished granite on ice, you can actually measure it. You can actually put an instrument on it and actually find out what the coefficient of friction is. 
you can do some twisting to see what the effect is of the um, when you spin the thing and then launch it. And they were able to develop a lovely control model for a robot that could actually do really quite well with curving, as long as you didn't have the sweeper in front of it, because that kind of messes things up rather bad. And in oh, yeah, and in those two bottom ones, the all of the parameters that were being used to, to uh, were being measured and fed into these systems, they're actually parameters of the control loop. Thing that controls the system. Those are where we can be fairly certain that there will be success because you are using data that is highly causal in the behavior of that machine. With machine learning, certainly generation three ones, we don't even know what the things are learning. The top one is uh, anecdotal. But it is also, there are various other examples that are very similar where the machine, it turned out that the machine learning system, because the data that was presented to it, didn't even know there were any tanks in the pictures at all. They only concentrated on the background. Because the, this is where the bias came in. All of the photos of Friendly were like that against the forest. All of the enemy ones were out in the desert, of course. Now, they could have solved it if they'd mixed had a good mixture of those against forests and all sorts of backgrounds, and the same for there. But they fortunately discovered that they didn't know anything about the um, tanks before they installed it in a tomahawk, I think it was, that it was intended to be put, put into. Or we, we're ma now beginning to know a bit more about the racist problems with cameras and vision systems, that they can't see people with black, dark, black faces. And it turns out the bias there was 1.5% of the photos for training were people like Joy Bull Winnie, who, by the way, has now got her PhD a couple of days ago. So congratulations to her. But she wanted to get the thing to say, hi, Joy, welcome, when she walked into her lab. And it couldn't see her face. So what we now need to be thinking about, variety. They should have had more variety in all those. Both in the face training one, the standard 100,000 photos that are used by everybody just about. So it turns out that we need to have much more variety in the data, but we need to be thinking about the design so we can pick up on that recidivist problem. Because some people would have, of a certain background, which is, yeah, but all of those are, and I can answer all of those, yes, and I'll be banned from jail, sort of banned from bail because of my socio-economic situation, my social environment. And we need to think about better ways of testing and having more people with different backgrounds. Because, you know, if you think back to the classic testing, it doesn't actually matter that much because you've got the UML or some other form of specification. And testing is all about turning that into the test harness, the test cases. It doesn't matter whether you've got a, clone, a whole set of clones, they'll do the competent job. But you can't do that with these learning systems because what's learned is based on the data. And we suddenly discover that, oh, we're disadvantaging black people. Or we're disadvantaged. Yeah, there's another one in the passport office in the UK. You're not supposed, when you submit a photo online, you mustn't be smiling, must you? Remember that one? So it vets it for smiling. Trouble is, before they implemented it, they already knew that 50% of the UK population probably would fail because they are African black and have larger lips than whites. And so they said, no, that photo is no good. And they didn't retrain it, sadly. So we need to be thinking about the diversity of our teams in ways we've never thought of before for the last 50 years. Like, or 35, 40 years I was involved in assisting our teams in the world. We didn't have to worry about diversity. Now, we do. Male, female, ethnicity, different social backgrounds and so on. It be, it's becoming incredibly important. So the takeaways for you today, ladies and gentlemen, are as follows. Lots of our business domains are at serious risk in relation to the AIA. 
And many of your companies will want to follow the AI lead, even if the UK government doesn't want to follow it, because you want to have a global market, you want to sell your systems or license them into the EU, and you will therefore need to follow these rules. Another question you have to think about is, is it just correlation there that's involved in the models, or is it causation? If it's causation, you've got half a chance. If it's co correlation, probably not. Biases are very significant in almost all data we have around us. You need to detect it early. That means you will have a diverse team who have the experience to find it. And it is also AI is very, very expensive, it seems, to productionize. A couple of books that you might well be interested in. Invisible Women by Karen Criado Perez is phenomenally good value for money. It is very, very well worth reading. Um, and it's about how the data we have around us is, is actually very, very biased in all sorts of different directions. And then the other one by Hannah Fry is also very, very good as well. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Any questions?